Hello everybody, so I'm back for episode five. So in this video, I'm just gonna show you kind of periodic updates of the plants, you know, along with more secrets, more tips, and other things I've been doing. Um, so I'm gonna sh first show you what the plants look like now, and then I'm gonna continue to do that um, over the course of a couple weeks. Okay, so here's the plant. Um, so today is Tuesday, May 10th. Um, as you can kind of see, the plant's quite a bit bigger than the last time I showed you. Um, so I just wanna show you kind of a few things I've been doing. Um, so firstly, I've been propping up the leaves with uh, some shims. Um, I guess paint sticks work just as well, but the reason why I like shims is that they got a little sharper point to them, so they're easier to push on the ground. Um, second thing I've done is moved the uh, strip lights, the grow lights, uh, closer to uh, the plant. Um, actually, I was mid-fertilizing here, so I need to move the other one, um, like this side, on the other side. Um, but the reason for this is kind of like what I was saying earlier, was just to try to get those secondaries growing out. Uh, sooner than past years. Um, past years actually haven't had lighting in the cold frame, so that's, I guess, an improvement this year. Um, so we'll see how that does. I'm not sure exactly how effective it's going to be, but I'm going to try. And then a um, uh, third thing I'm going to do, or third thing I've done, actually, is try to stabilize the vine here. Um, so since the secondaries are so young and they're so short, um, you don't want to um, bury the vine quite yet. I mean, Later in the year, you definitely want to bury all your vines because um, burying your vines will trigger a root growth. Um, so basically, there's a secondary root system that you can um, get by burying your vines or burying the nodes in your vines or the intersections between the leaf stem, leaf stalk, and the vine. So at those intersections, there'll be two roots, one root going up at that intersection, one root going down in the soil. And so the well, soil is already there, so the root that's going down will already be there. Um, but the root that's going up is going to be you know, you can harness that extra um, root mass by bearing uh, the nodes. So that's kind of a big tip for growing bigger pumpkins. I, I don't know, you have a hard time um, growing a really big pumpkin if you don't do that. Um, but the point though is I'm not doing that quite yet because the problem with bearing too soon is that you'll smother these secondaries which aren't quite long enough. So you want to have the secondaries get around, I don't know, six, eight inches or whatever before you start bearing. Um, because then the problem with that is then you'll cover the secondaries with dirt and then no light will get to the secondaries and then you can figure out what will happen after that. <laughs> the secondaries will die and then you'll just have one, one main vine and no secondaries, so don't wanna do that. So those are the only extra things I've been doing lately um, other than the, you know, the traditional stuff that I described last video. So you know, fertilizing, you know, venting the cold frame, you know, keep the cold frame closed at night, space heater, lights, fertilizing with the fertilizing program I described in the previous video also. So other than that, just kind of stabilize the vine, um, prop up the leaves so the lights can uh, try to draw out those secondaries early and then just protect the tip at all costs. Because if you break the tip off the main vine, that's the apical meristem, that's where all other, um, you know, growth uh, leads. That's where all our future South Dakota State record pumpkin, hopefully, <laughs> will come from. Well, it's just that, ex that little tip there. So that's the most important thing. You know, if one of your leaves gets a couple holes in it or something, you know, that's not the end of the world. If it gets burned, it's not the end of the world. But like the really big important thing is that, that tip. So I'd originally actually had the heater pointed like the short ways of the cold frame. Um, and so what I just did is I just moved it this way. So it's blowing hot air this way. Um, and the reason for that is because you don't want to have that hot air blowing on that tip. You can burn it. Um, I originally did have an oscillating heater, so that's even better because it kind of oscillates back and forth and has more even distribution of heat. Um, but for some reason, that one broke. I don't know why. Maybe it was just like, rated for indoor use or something. <laughs> but um, yeah, so I had to get this one, and so far it's been working. Don't jinx it, <laughs> I guess. Um, but I think that's all I was going to say. Um, oh, that's it. Uh, one more thing. I was just going to say everyone makes mistakes. Everything's hat all sorts of things happen and so one thing that's kind of happened to me recently is you see this in the main vine it's kind of a little kink so when the vine um was growing out you know kind of what i warned about to, that you want to stabilize it well i was stabilizing it and everything and i don't know exactly what happened but somehow on the final stages of the vine laying down it kind of kinked it and kind of twisted it kind of weird um, there are no cracks or anything, so hopefully it won't be a big issue. But just kind of a remi reminder that, you know, mistakes happen to everybody. You know, things happen to everybody. And, you know, this shouldn't be, you know, you know, a season-ending um, issue. But anyway, I just wanted to show you that.
Okay, so, so sorry for not updating you sooner. Um, there's a few things I need to catch you up on. Uh, so the first thing is that the plant outgrew the small cold frame, so I moved it to this larger 10 foot by 20 foot uh, hoop house that I got off eBay. Um, and so the reason for that was that and we had like 70 mile an hour winds uh, a week ago, and then in a couple days we're gonna have freezing nights. So just it really wasn't an option to just, you know, not have any kind of covering over it at all because it would get, you know, you know, pulled out of the ground by the wind and then <laughs> then we get you know frozen <laughs> in a couple days. So I needed to uh, get this covering on top of it, um, and then I and then I just moved all the lights and then the heater and then everything else inside here. Um, so uh, it's actually a pretty nice. Uh, uh, hoop house, but um, you anyway, know, I was just gonna show you today was uh, how I bury vines. Um, so I actually bury vine the main vine earlier. I didn't show you. I apologize on that. Um, but it's the same process for all the vines throughout the entire season. Um, so let me just get in here first. Okay, we're in the hoop house now. You can kind of get a better view of the plant here. Um, so the reason why I bury vines and a lot of other growers bury vines is at each leaf vine intersection, uh, the vine shoots out. Uh, two roots so one root that goes down into the ground and then another root that goes up into the air uh, but unless you bury the vines um that means put dirt on top of the vines um, that root won't really thrive it'll just kind of wither and die so like half your root system like isn't there so by burying your vines you can like double your root system you know double your intake of water double your you know fertilizer intake so it really helps quite a lot so um, it's, you know, if you, if you aren't bearing vines right now, you really should because it'll really help your um, potential weight a lot. So um, as far as what I also put under the root, so along with just the dirt, I put a few amendments. So these amendments are a lot, you know, similar amendments to what I um, use in the planting hole and then what I use in the seed sowing videos and everything. Okay, so I use, um, so this is per leaf vine intersection node. Um, and you multiply by how many nodes you're going to bury. Um, but for each node, I use uh, one tablespoon of the mycorrhizal inoculant. I do a half tablespoon of the 934 slow-release granular fertilizer. And then I do another half tablespoon of the 284 Gaia Green um, slow-release slow fertilizer. Um, I do a half tablespoon of that uh, horticultural uh, molasses, I do um, a teaspoon or half teaspoon, three quarters teaspoon, somewhere on there of azos, so that's that nitrogen fixing bacteria, and then another similar around three quarters teaspoon, teaspoon kind of somewhere around there of that root shield stuff. I don't really have enough root shield to bury the entire plant, like once the plant fills the whole garden, um, but I do use it, you know, in the main, um, main vine and then like the first couple nodes of the secondary is where. Um, kind of the main central part of the plant. Um, so anyway, um, I'll put uh, this actually, if you mix this all together, it's around three tablespoons under each root. So I have a little three tablespoon coffee measure scoop, I think. So I just do one scoop like this. And then I put it under in kind of around uh, that leaf fine intersection and kind of work it around in the dirt. And then after I do that, I'll put one shovel load of dirt on top of each node. Um, so I used to actually bury the, or sorry, um, I used to uh, dig trenches for the vines. Um, so that means like dig a trench and then put the vine in the trench. Um, but I realized, I think, and I'm not sure if this is really, I guess, exactly what's happening, but, um, really, really a problem of it. Um, I, mean, I think it's probably still fine way to go about it, but, um, I, I feel that when you dig, dig a trench, I guess the vine is in lower than the surface of the dirt. So that trench will kind of accumulate water. And I think you can possibly rot your vines that way. So by doing it, like have the vine just on the surface of the soil and then by mounding dirt on top of it, that way that the water, you can still like, you know, wet the water, wet, uh, wet the dirt on top of it, but it won't like pool and rot your vines that way. So uh, I got 20 uh, nodes here I'm gonna bury. And so I'll bring you back uh, once I do that. Okay, so I forgot to say something actually really important, um, and that is at each intersection here, along with the roots, there's another vine uh, that grows off that secondary. Um, so pumpkins are a branching plant, so off the main, there'll be secondaries. Off the secondaries, there'll be tertiary vines. Off the tertiary vines, there'll be like what, quaternary vines, etc. Um, so what you want to do is, in order to kind of keep a nice, clean um, patch and not have a, 
jumbled up mess, you're gonna wanna trim these. Now you can either like wait, you know, a little bit until they're like, you know, foot long or whatever and chop them, but that kinda can cause a little shock to the plant, right? Because there's, you know, there's something there and you're kind of removing a portion of the plant. But when there's these little, these little buds and you can just pinch them off, right here, these little fine, I don't know if you can see that, much less stress the plant. So this is the little tertiary vine. So we just want basically just straight secondary. So I, I use a Christmas tree pattern. I mean, there's a few other patterns out there, but I just use a Christmas tree pattern. So you have the main vine here, and it looks like a Christmas tree, right? You have the secondaries that just go out, just straight out. And then at the, when they reach the end of the patch, you just terminate them. And just, it's much easier to kind of work around the plant. Like I'll place boards in between here so I can kind of get to the center of the plant, et cetera. Um, you know, when you have, you know, br branching mess, it's just, it's you know, really hard to kind of work around the plant. And then also, you, you know, these secondaries are the, main pipes, you know, or actually main, main vines are like main pipe, but you know, these are nice strong, the, you know, they harvest a lot of nutrients and the, 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 normally that like the tertiaries and the quaternaries tend to be a little, a little weaker. Um, so you really want to just keep the main strong part of the plant. But anyway, I just wanted to show you that. Okay. So all the plants vines are now buried. Uh, what I just did was fertilize it. So I gave it 12 gallons of, um, some fish and some seaweed, um, cause it's Wednesday today. Um, and so it's a good idea to fertilize after you vine berry, not the other way around, um, because you know, when you fertilize, the soil gets all wet, muddy, and so when you're vine bearing, you're having to work around the plant, so you can get um, you know, it's just sloppy, muddy mess. So, you know, not ideal conditions to be working around the plant. Um, and then also you're going to be compacting the soil more when the soil is wet than when it's dry. Um, second reason, I guess, is you know the roots are kind of young, right? So once you bury them, it's a good idea to try to get some nutrients down there first so they can really start thriving and then also all that dry soil that you put down that'll really absorb a lot of um, water or fertilizer right so it's a good idea to try to fertilize and get all that um, vine bearing mixture um, wet it'll hold down the vines too like if you have just dry mix on top of your top of your vines it'll, the vines will just pop right back up it's not really going to hold or stabilize the vines at all so it's a good idea to I mean, I guess you can pre-wet the mix a little bit too, just a little bit pre-wet, just to make it, you know, so the vines will stay down. Um, but either way, it's a good idea to, even, even just water is fine. Um, Fertilizer is probably better just because you can get some nutrients down, um, but that'll also kind of keep the vines down. But uh, anyway, I think that's all I'm going to, I can really show you right now. Um, so hopefully I'll update you or try to update you in a couple days when the plant's getting a little bigger. So bye for now. I am back, so today is May 29th. Um, the plant's quite a bit bigger than the last time I showed you. Um, so the secondary is around seven, eight feet long. So the width of the plant's around 15 feet, and the main vine's 14 feet long or so. So almost a perfect equilateral triangle. Um, anyway, last night I pulled off the hoop house. I was trying to contain the plant inside the hoop house because we were getting some um, bleak forecasts in the future. So particularly Tuesday night um, when it's low of 36, so I don't know what I'm going to do now, I'm going to probably have to make some makeshift structure to try to keep it from being frozen. Um, but there was just no way I was going to be able to keep that um, plant inside a 10 foot wide hoop house for another four days. So I had to rip off the band-aid, so to speak. And then we'll go from there to see what we're going to have to do to protect the plant on Tuesday. Um, but anyway, um, I also put up the hail netting so you can kind of see that. I actually leave the hail netting on all year. Um, so it's actually not very helpful when it's cloudy because it's reducing the light transmission even more. Um, but it actually does, well, obviously it helps with hail. It staves off a lot of disasters like that. Um, but normally in like in the summer when we get these like crystal clear, just brutally hot um, days, you know, the hail netting does actually help with that because, it, you know, it kind of diffuses the incoming light and it kind of makes it a little more pleasant in here instead of that just really harsh, intense sun that's really hot. So it basically is like very low percentage shade cloth um anyways what i also did is um after i took the hoop house off last night i buried all the vines so same same as usual same same way that i showed you last time so i put all my kind of amendments under each root node um, and then i buried them um so also i put some uh i crisscrossed some shims over the vines and that was just to hold them in place um so since i just buried the vines the roots that were holding the the vines to the ground aren't developed enough so basically the vines not attached to the ground at all <laughs> and since we're going to get some pretty nasty winds um last night and 
a couple more nights in the future here um i wanted to make sure that the, that that those vines were you know held to the ground at least somewhat so that the wind wouldn't just grab some just rip them out of the ground and trash the plant um so it looks like i made it through the night okay um anyway i was we thought we were gonna get rain but um as you can see we didn't i don't think we got much at least because you can see the impression of like the 10 by 20 foot uh cold frame here um um, that's that's dry because <laughs> it didn't get soaked with rain was the outside did get um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna probably just do a normal fertilizer um, solution here so it's Sunday so we get the essential and the companion um, fertilizer um, so I'll just go ahead and do that okay so I apologize I forgot to tell you which fertilizer I switched from the 123114 plant marble fertilizer to so when the secondaries were on three feet long I switched to the 1179 Weather fertilizer by plant food company so i've been doing that at around slightly less than two teaspoons per gallon so that gives me around a 250 ppm of n 260 somewhere around there which is like almost double like the 115 ppm of n that the 1251 gave so we want around around that amount of n maybe pushing 300 maybe a few days but you don't want to probably go too much over you know the 300 mark because then you can start getting you know um, nitrogen bloat and then in some of the worst cases you can actually um uh, fry your vine tips so that's what happened to me last year which set me back quite a lot because then i had to diverge tertiary vines off the secondaries and that was a kind of a nightmare so i don't want to go there so you know you want to make sure that you're pushing the plant but you don't want to go hog wild to the point that you're you know doing more harm than good so i think around slightly less than two teaspoons per gallon should be safe um, again, depending on your soil test, let's so say if you have like really high nitrogen in your soil test, so usually I strive for around 50, 60 ppm of N maybe in my soil test. I don't know. I mean, I know some people go like as high as like 90. Um, I don't know. It's ends ends a really complicated number in the soil test. It can be all over the place. But anyway, say if you're like, like over like 100, say, ppm of nitrogen, I don't know if you really want to give any nitrogen at all to the plant. You might be better off just um, doing this fertilizer maybe like at a much less dose like say like a half teaspoon per gallon or something but anyway um so that's what i was just going to show you there tell you there um yeah anyway i think um that's pretty much it f um to show you um for at least a little while now um so maybe i'll update you uh, uh soon i am back so late last night i got back from california so i was there for my high school graduation um, so I graduated from Stanford Online High School, so they had the graduation ceremony at Stanford, so we flew out there to do that. Um, just because we were in California, we ended up spending an extra week there to do some of the fun activities there. So went to the beach a couple few times, kind of hang, hanged out, you know, celebrated, etc. Um, but nonetheless, it was a little bit uh, nerve-wracking um, being away for so long. We ended up being gone for like 10 days. Um, so anyway, the plant looks okay, I guess. Um, it was a lot of work to be done because I was gone for so long and there's like six feet of vine that has not been buried. And um, as you can see, the hoses, or sorry, the vines have grown over the hoses. I'm going to have to flip those around. And there's, there's got a lot of work to be done. Um, so um, I'll thank, I'll shout out to uh, uh, the person who take care of this uh, plant when I was gone. So um, they, uh, she did a very good job um, uh, watching over this plant here. Um, uh, so make sure nothing horrible or anything cat catastrophic happened. Um, so she did a very good job. Um, anyway, so I'll have to, you know, get everything cleaned up. Okay, so I actually did do a tissue test before we left for California. I did take a video on it, but for some reason I got deleted. Um, so I have no idea how that happened. Um, so I apologize on that, but uh, basically I'll just show you kind of how to do it here. It's not really all that complicated. Um, so basically you just take, um, you, you cut off the leaf that's around five to six leaves behind the growing tip. So this is the growing tip, and this is like leaf one, leaf two, leaf three, uh, leaf four, leaf five, leaf six, or so. So any of these two leaves, I guess. Um, so if you cut off this leaf, it's at the base. So you cut it off at the base or so, or maybe a little bit higher than the base, I don't know, somewhere around there, where you have like six inches of, vine, six inches of stock or something. I don't know, it doesn't really, really matter, just as long as it's not like you know, two feet of stock or something that you can't find a cardboard box to put it into, ship it. But um, anyway, after you do that, you want to cut like a two, 
uh, one to two inch circle or so kind of around this leaf, like kind of where I'm um, moving my finger around. So you cut this part of the leaf off, but you leave, you preserve this inner part here. So you also test that. Um, so after you do that, um, what I did is I uh, you know, cut up a cardboard, uh, sorry, a um, paper bag, rolled that up in it, and then put it in a cardboard box. So you're gonna have to go to Western Labs site, and that's where I did the tissue test. That's they do tissue tests specifically for Atlantic giant pumpkins. So I definitely recommend them. Um, you're gonna have to go to their website. I think I can maybe put the link to the form in the description below. Um, but you basically find that and then print it out and then you have to fill out the form. It's not like that bad of a form. They ask you for like your email so they can send you test results, your name, etc. cetera. Um, anyway, after you do that, um, you have to sign a check. I think it's like $46 or something or money, but check probably was better. Um, send that in the mail and then within like a week to like 10 days or something, um, you'll have your test results. So I sent it in about like a couple days before I left and then it was, um, it was, it was back um, um, right like a day before I came home. So it was, it was really fast. So anyway, the tissue test um, came back pretty good. Um, or my tissue test came back pretty good. I was like ever so slightly low in copper. Um, I'm not going to really worry about that. I could maybe do a little fuller um, feed of copper. But, you know, as micronutrients are a little sensitive, so you don't want to overdo that. Um, otherwise, we were high on magnesium, which isn't surprising because, well... Um, my soil test said that it was really high. Potassium was also really high. Um, nitrogen was a tad high, but then again, that's kind of what you want um, when you're, you know, growing plant like this early in the season, trying to get a really big plant before you pollinate. Phosphorus was, you know, a little high. So I think what I might do here is we got a bunch of rain here. So I think that might be good to just, you know, not um, water for a few days because the rain, like we got like two inches of rain, like in five minutes la last night, which was crazy. Um, so like probably won't water for a few days, like at least, <laughs> like honestly, we got like two weeks worth of rain, but I guess it doesn't really work that way because it either evaporates. I don't know. We'll see. I'll water when the soil looks, you know, like it needs water. But, um, well, I think it'll be probably a bit good to kind of, um, take a little bit of a break on the fertilizer. Um, since you don't want to burn them, um, it's kind of all about reading the plant. So, um, Basically, you can kind of get a few signs here. Um, you want to push it, but you're going to make sure you're not, you know, going to hurt the plant, do more harm than good. So you can kind of see there's a few signs here. So I mean, these are good. This is like where I want the plant to be, but you don't want it any higher than this, you know. So the, see how the vines are kind of curling up a little bit, or standing up a little bit like this. This is maybe a better angle here. So that's what you want. That, that, that basically tells you that you're pushing the plant. It's growing as fast as it can with the conditions, with, with, with the, you know, weather conditions it's given. Um, now, if you see, like, vines that are standing, like, three feet up or something, and we call them cobra vines, um, that means you're giving way too much nitrogen. Um, if you see, like, right here might be, like, a very early sign of, like, nitrogen bloat, a slightly... Actually, this was, that wasn't this leaf. Which one was it? Um, I think it was, I don't know, one of these leaves. But basically, nitrogen bloat is where, like, it's, like, almost, it's, like, so dark green, it's almost, like, purpley blue. Um, and then it kind of swells up around the leaf, and you don't really get a flat leaf. Anyway, that's kind of a sign that you kind of want to take a break with the nitrogen. Um, oh, I think this is what it is. This is what it was right here. So you can kind of see it's... Um, kind of almost purpley and kind of swelled up here. So that's that's um, that's that's excess of nitrogen right there. Um, so you want to make sure you see these warning signs here. Otherwise, you know, if you ignore them or if you don't see them, um, and you just keep pushing them, you can really end up hurting the plants. That's what happened last year. Um, I think it was also combined with the extreme heat we got. We had like hundred. 509 degree temperatures last year in June. So that was, that was crazy. So I hope we don't have that again. Um, but, uh, what happened was, um, I fried my vine tips. So that's another symptom of, um, nitrogen overdose. That's when you really overdo it and you don't really see the signs. Um, and so these ones basically had to get chopped off cause they were dead. And then I had to train tertiaries and it was a big pain. So I don't want to have you experienced that? Um, so just giving you, you know, a warning sign. Um, tip here so to not um, repeat my mistake. Um, 
So these vine tips look all healthy, so so we're good there. But uh, anyway, so hopefully um, that gave you a better idea how to do a tissue test. Anyways, I think this is going to be the end of this video. So I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you got something out of it. Um, the intention of this video was to show you the progress of the plant from when it was inside the cold frame to right before we're going to pollinate. Um, I might update you, um, you know, very quickly, you know, after I get this plant all cleaned up, after I get the vines buried, after I get the hoses, you know, reorganized, etc. Um, but for the most part, yeah, this is the end of this video. Um, so next video is going to be um, about pollinating and how to do that. So you know, I'll tell you how to do that. I'll share more tips and you know, secrets and other things that I do. Um, so stay tuned for that video. Um, this is the part of the season where things get interesting, things get fun. Um, so, uh, yeah, so stay tuned for that. And so for now, bye.